All right, we're starting a new series today in the book of 2 Timothy. So 2 Timothy chapter 1, verses 1 to 8. Paul, an apostle of Christ Jesus by the will of God in keeping with the promise of life that is in Christ Jesus, to Timothy, my dear son, grace, mercy, and peace from God the Father and Christ Jesus our Lord. I thank God whom I serve as my ancestors did with a clear conscience. As night and day, I constantly remember you in my prayers. Recalling your tears, I long to see you so that I may be filled with joy. I am reminded of your sincere faith, which first lived in your grandmother Lois and in your mother Eunice, and I am persuaded now lives in you also. For this reason, I remind you to fan into flame the gift of God, which is in you through the laying on of my hands. For the spirit God gave us does not make us timid, but gives us power, love, and self-discipline. So do not be ashamed of the testimony about our Lord or of me, his prisoner. Rather, join with me in suffering for the gospel by the power of God. Well, good morning and welcome. We're glad you're here. No, you're good. I was like, can you leave some of that candy? (laughs) Uh, All of us want to make a difference. Like all of us want to leave a mark. All of us want to live for things that last. And that's really a biblical thought. I've heard this biblical teaching summarized with this idea that you were created on purpose with purpose. And I feel like so much of this new series that we're getting into from second, in 2 second Timothy that we're going to be calling Endure is about just that. We're going to talk about how to endure through life's challenges and leave a lasting impact. Um, this letter was written in the very last few weeks, if not days, before the Apostle Paul was killed, executed. Uh, this is during a time when persecution was, was increased to a heightened level for the early church. Uh, the Roman Emperor Nero had just been increasingly descending into madness. After the, the burning of Rome in A.D. 64, he blamed Christians for it. And so uh, Christians were being killed at this point. And, and Paul was, was next up, essentially. He wrote this letter from, from prison. This is what's known as uh, a pastoral epistle. It's a, it's a prison epistle as well. Epistle means... Uh, a, a letter. He wrote it to the young protege, a guy he mentored, the young pastor Timothy, and it's just filled with emotional language. But he's writing this while chained, and uh, you know he's chained in a Roman uh, cell. Uh, the, his first imprisonment it was was more of a house arrest sort of situation where he could go about do his thing. Uh, he just had to show up for his court appointment. Okay, but this time it, it was completely different. He was in a, such a scary situation that most of his friends couldn't even find where he was, though they searched for him, for him really, really uh, dearly. And, and he just, after having escaped any number of miraculous events of, you know, escaping the mouths of lions at one point when he traveled through wilderness, we're told, escaping a, a scary shipwreck, a shipwreck, he, he escaped some, some uh, stoning. Uh, this time he knew the end was near. And as I mentioned earlier, many scholars believe that if, if he didn't have uh, just days, he had only weeks before he was, he was killed. And so as he sat there in this cell, he thought of, his, of, this, of this guy he'd been investing his life into, this guy Timothy. And his, his main theme to him and through him to us was, was to endure. Keep at it, Timothy. And, and so we see here how we can persevere even when life gets hard, such that we're, we leave a lasting impact um, one of my hopes in, in preaching through, through, uh, with the, the, the sermon topics that we, we talk about is to give ourselves a well-rounded biblical diet. So we've looked at in the, in the recent past some Old Testament scriptures. We, we went through a gospel or a New Testament account focusing on the life and ministry of Jesus directly. Now we're going to get into an epistle or a letter from one of the early church leaders to, to the church. And here we see how to endure. And I think that's really important because... I want to pick up where we left off with the last series when we talked about what it means to be a fully developing follower of Jesus. Because being a fully developing follower of Jesus in all the ways that we described, it doesn't just happen in a vacuum. It happens in the real world, and the real world comes with challenges, suffering, hardship. 
and just to be real, you know, for Christians in some ways, that's getting increasingly hard. Now, I want to be real quick to say our persecution, if we can call it that, is nowhere near to the degree that Paul, Timothy, and, the, and, and other Christians in this day and age faced it. But still, it is growing. What do I mean by that? Well, this last week we were at a conference and I got to hear uh, one study that found, uh, at least in America, up until about the mid-90s for Christians, they often lived in a positive worldview towards them. And uh, the speaker was talking about how, you know, up until about the, ni- uh, the, the mid-90s, particularly outside of places like the Bay Area, but you could put on your resume that you're a Christian, and that wouldn't necessarily be a bad thing. But around the mid-90s, something shifted a little bit, such that about then we entered into more of a neutral worldview towards Christians. Okay. But then the study went on to say about the mid-2010s, Christians now live in America, at least, in an increasingly negative worldview towards them. And so what we want to do through this series is talk about how not only we can endure, you know, just kind of make it through challenges, hardship, but also be the light and source of love and life that God calls us to in an increasingly divisive, pain-ridden world. And, you know, I think with the election coming up, that's all the more true, that Christians ought to lead out in life, light, and love. How do we do that? Today, as we open up this book and look at the first few words, we're going to look at three things we need to know in order to leave a lasting impact and three ways we need to live in order to have lasting impact. So three things to know, three ways to live. But first, let's pray. Father, thank you for your word, how it's living and active, sharper than a double-edged sword and it speaks to us, and, it, and through your Spirit, it molds us increasingly into the likeness of Jesus. And it, and it beckons us home. If, if some are here today, they're checking out your claims, checking out Christianity. We pray, I, I pray especially, most of all, that you'd help them understand who you are and what you've done for them. But Father, as we, as your church, come together under, under your word, would you speak to us through it and mold us into the people that you've called us to be. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, so three things to know when it comes to living for what, for what lasts. Number one, we see here, God works generationally. So something we need to know in terms of living for things that last, having lasting impact, is God works generationally. I love this thought because if you came in today and I told you there's three things we need to know, what would you guess one of those things are? I'm guessing most of us probably wouldn't have gone, oh, God works generationally would be a thought. But it's really important. And it's so much so that Paul is stressing it here, emphasizing it here. He says, to Timothy, my dear son, if you'd like to mark your Bible, I would encourage you to underline, highlight the words, my dear son. Grace, mercy, and peace from God the Father and Christ Jesus our Lord. I thank God whom I serve as my ancestors did with a clear conscience as night and day. I constantly remember you in my prayers. So already we're seeing this emotion pour out of Paul, right? He knows he doesn't have a lot of time and he's just thinking of, of, of all the things he could be thinking about, of all the things he could be praying for as he has weeks, if not days, to live, the thing that he's thinking about, the thing he's most praying for is Timothy. I'm reminded of your sincere faith, he goes on, which first lived in your grandmother Lois and in your mother Eunice. You can underline, highlight those women. And I'm persuaded that faith now lives in you also. Timothy would go on to change the world. We know this because we're sitting today in a Christian gathering. Now, God could have used other means to accomplish his work, but the point is this. There weren't a lot of Christians back then, let alone facing the persecution that they did, let alone leaders like Timothy. We are here today because of God working through the likes of Timothy, but don't miss this, Paul is saying, that first originated, that faith, that strength from these wonderful women, his grandmother Lois and his mother Eunice. Uh, we do this little uh, fun get-to-know-you question in Alpha where we go, okay, first night, just to kind of break the ice, start getting to know each other and get into conversation. If you happen to get stuck in an elevator, who would you want to get stuck? You know, if anybody in history, who would you want to get stuck in? I'm starting to think, I would love to get stuck in there with Lois and Eunice. Could you imagine letting their faith rub off on you? The incredible pillars of faith these women were such that we are sitting here today because of God's work generationally through them. God works generationally. I think this is one of these things that we often just fail to understand or fully realize. But God works in powerful ways, ways that last 
generationally. One of my absolute favorite things to do as a pastor here in the Silicon Valley is every so often, uh, parents or grandparents of yours will come and visit, and maybe you'll introduce them to me. I love conversations like those. I never, I never like kind of directly like walked into this, but n- ever like in an increasing fashion, when that happens, depending on the circumstances and the relationship and all that's going on, often what will happen is, hey, I want you to meet my parents, and I'll look at the parent and I'll say, I thank God for your ministry. <laughs> thank you for all that you do. Current is so blessed, and they're like, what are you, you talking? I'm just visiting. Like, I'm, I'm just here to see my son. I'm just here to see my daughter. Like, I, I don't think you understand. I'm not trying to move here or anything. Like, no, 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 you, you're not understanding me. Thank you for your ministry to them and through them. Because if not for your ministry to them and through them, we would not be the church seeing the fruit that we're seeing today in the Silicon Valley. People coming to faith regularly. People growing in their faith regularly. How did that come about if not for, in many cases, the men and women, mom and dads, grandparents, in your lives, investing in you generationally such that even, yes, in a place like the Silicon Valley, a place not known for being all that receptive towards Christianity, we're seeing God advance his gospel, build his church. I'll say, thank you for your ministry. And once I start to get there, tears might start to well up, I've seen. Why are they welling up in that case? Often because they haven't seen or fully realized the impact, the ripple out effect of their generational ministry. And just to be clear, it's not just the biological generational ministry that Paul's highlighting here. Remember I had you highlight, underline another word, if that's, if that's you? He said, I write this to you, Timothy, my dear son. Paul was not Timothy's biological dad. In fact, we are introduced to Timothy in the book of Acts chapter 16. And there we're told about his mom, who was a, who was a follower of Christ already and the faith that she already had. And we're also introduced to his dad, just kind of given a little side bit of information that he's there. And it's heavily implied that Timothy's biological dad was not a follower of Jesus, at least not at the time. And if anything, was probably, if anything, a little bit unsupportive of that whole Christian thing. I pray that he ended up putting his faith in the Lord. But Paul, for his part, became a spiritual father to Timothy, such that even as he's chained there awaiting his execution, He's thinking about Timothy. He's praying for Timothy, recalling him with tears. God works generationally, whether through biological connections or spiritual connections or the both or any combination in between. And so what does this mean for us in terms of application? Well, I want to start with some low-hanging fruit. There is opportunity to serve with the kids. (laughs) You know, you you think about serving in kids' ministry and the opportunity for having lasting impact. Youth, for instance, and the little ones as well back there. I, I'm reminded of, you know, it's been pretty fun. So Cindy, my, you know, she was just up here, our executive director, my wife. Uh, she, put her, she put her faith in the Lord as a teenager. So in a youth group that was held in, in Upper State uh, New York, she, she found the Lord, put, started to follow the Lord there. And I've gotten to know some of her old youth group leaders, which has all, always been fun. Whether it was a wedding or some sort of reunion, I've gotten to meet them over time. And part of the joy is seeing them go like, wow, you know, just kind of getting, for me, getting to meet the people whom God used to help Cindy put her faith in the Lord. I mean, there's a, there's a feel there when I get to know them and meet them and just think about God's goodness through that. And yet what's also really fun is to see them sometimes connect the dots with what God is now doing through Cindy, impacting others, let alone ger- generationally through her. And that's all that they could just see. Partly I'm going like, wow, they're encouraged by that. If they only knew what God's doing through Cindy and and others like her here in the Silicon Valley through, through current. God works generationally. And it's like, man, how many of us, for those of us who did grow up in church background, can remember some of the wonderful men and women who poured in their lives into us, teaching us on Sundays or as youth group leaders or whatever the case is. I, for one, am hoping making them proud. You know what I'm saying? Let alone increasing their generational impact of God working through them. So that's one low-hanging fruit. Serve in the kids' ministry. There's opportunity for that. You can write it on your connection card. We love to, there's always opportunity there. I mean, the, the kids' ministry is growing. There's like more than 100 kids back there on Sundays. It's awesome. God entrusts that with, to us. And we get to be a part of that generational impact through them. Okay, another low-hanging fruit. Parents, grandparents, are you intentionally investing in your kids? In things that last? Meaning, not just investing in them in terms of like worldly achievements. It's not to say those are terrible things. But are you investing in them in, as far as like their character and, and God-given biblical values? Are you modeling that for them? Are you, are you 
encouraging intentionally. And I'll just confess as a pastor and dad myself, I, I was struck with this. Like, I got to be more intentional, thoughtful about it. As much as I love and love my kids, I, you know, I got to be, th- I got to be thoughtful about that. We just, is, is that an area that you can kind of invest in generationally? And then I would say, for some of you, you're sitting there like, I'm not a parent. Maybe one day you'll be a parent. Maybe you, you don't think you'll be a parent, but one day you'll be a parent. But hey, you know what? You're also investing in your future kids, whether that's in a biological sense or a spiritual sense. Now, what do I mean by that? If you go on to have kids, the choices that you are making now is investing in them one way or another into the future, wouldn't you say? The type of people you date, the decisions you make while you're dating, the kind of life values that you're instilling into yourself here and now, including serving the Lord, not serving the Lord, being part of his church, not be, being, all these sorts of decisions. And then I would also love to just highlight the fact that um, I, we're, I'm so thankful that we have a growing group of folks who are more mature in years. We love you. You have a C++ group that we were calling for. Yeah, it's wonderful. You guys are blessed with the crown of wisdom by way of gray hair. Not all of you guys, none of you guys. I just want to take a moment and highlight how grateful and a direct answer to prayer you are. Because we live in a young professional world. That's the Silicon Valley, okay? But we also, as a church, have a church of young professionals who are young both physically speaking, but also spiritually speaking, which means you have a ministry unto the rest of us, informally, formally perhaps, like Paul had unto Timothy, that can have generational impact in far greater ways than you could probably think or, or fully understand or see. And I'll just say, if that's you, you can lean into that. Boy, there's many of us in the room who would be like, yes, please, lean into that. First thing we need to understand is that God works generationally. Second thing we need to know is that he's uniquely gifted you for his great purpose. You're uniquely gifted for the purpose that he has in your life. For this reason, for the faith that you have that was instilled into you by your grandmother, your your mama. For this reason, I remind you, Timothy, to fan into flame the gift of God, which is in you through the laying on of my hands. We're not gift, Timothy. We're not told specifically what gift that is. You know what I'm saying? A lot of biblical scholars and commentators have taken a lot of time and used a lot of ink to try to figure out what specific gift Timothy had that Paul was trying to encourage him to fan into flame. Many of them, probably most of them, think that Paul was probably referring to the gift of teaching in Timothy. Because there are many other places, including in this very letter, but also another letter that Paul wrote to Timothy, where, where Paul is repeatedly encouraging Timothy to teach Timothy, make sure you're teaching, make sure you're exhorting the church. So maybe that's what he was saying. He's a, you know, this is a young pastor, so maybe Paul was saying, hey, fan into flame the gift of teaching. Uh, others think maybe Paul was speaking to the gift of evangelism in Timothy. Remember, this was a pagan society that lived in, very few Christians, and Timothy was out there starting churches and doing churches. And you know, so the gift of evangelism, sharing the faith, helping people into the faith was probably a gift at some think. Maybe that was the gift that Paul is saying fan into flame. We're not told. Some think it was the gift of, of leadership that Paul is saying fan into flame. You know, because Timothy as a young pastor was not only leading one church, he was kind of doing some regional uh, preaching and leading of the churches, of, of all these different churches in the area. So maybe, maybe it was Paul saying, hey, fan into flame, the gift of leadership, oh, Timothy. We're not told. And actually it hit me this week that that's actually very helpful and relevant for us because Paul was saying to Timothy, hey, you know the gift I'm referring to. I don't need to spell it out. Fan into flame that gift you know I'm talking about. And I love that he didn't go to the teaching gift or whatever because if we were reading this, we'd be like, all right, let's focus in on teaching gifts, everybody. Instead, we see kind of more holistically, God has gifted each of us in a unique way. And the question is, are you tying that to the greater purpose he has for your life? Okay, now what is that greater purpose? We'll come back to the gift thing in a minute. What purpose? Towards what end? Uh, Boy, I I hope this sounds like a repeat, broken record kind of thing. Because here's a verse I want to put up constantly, whenever I can. Because our purpose is Jesus' purpose and mission for the church. What is that? The Great Commission. Matthew 28. In fact, we've had a slide that we put together a while ago. Remember the airplane slide? I love this. It just helps us get, get our heads around it. Jesus said, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Therefore, go and make disciples, he said to his followers, to his church, then and today. Make disciples of all nations, baptizing in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey all that I've commanded you. There's two wings of the airplane, so to speak. There's helping people know Christ, 
into the faith, help people into the faith, and those who have put their faith in him, help them grow in Christ, help people find Christ, help people follow him. Is this making sense? And so that's our purpose. The, these are the things that last for eternity, will have lasting impact. The things that for followers of Christ, we'll be, we'll be celebrating for all eternity. God has uniquely gifted you to be a part of this mission. Do you know how you're gifted uniquely to help push, help people know Christ, help people grow in Christ? And there's a few ways we can just kind of lay out a few of them. I'll, I'll, I want to go through these quickly. That you might be gifted, that you probably are gifted. One, it could be a spiritual gift. Okay, we already kind of talked about that. For Paul, it could have been teaching. It could have been evangelism. It could have been uh, leadership. But there are also the gifts of helps, showing mercy, encouragement, prayer, uh, hospitality. I love the gift of hospitality because if you look at where we are introduced to Timothy in Acts 16, he came to faith in somebody's house, meaning someone had to open up their house make available their house such that Paul could come in there, teach the gospel, Timothy could receive Christ. If not for that person opening their house, so it was a gift of hospitality and, and the like. Do you know how you're gifted? Uh, other ways that we're gifted. Opportunities. Opportunities. You know, Paul was not just saying to Timothy, fan into flame the gift that God has given you in a vacuum. Timothy was, at the time of Paul's writing, almost certainly in Ephesus, pastoring the church there, working in and through the church in Ephesus. And so Paul was saying, hey, with whatever's going on there, with however God's working there in that church, through that church, fan into flame your gift, meaning there's opportunities all around us. Are you, do you have the eyes for them? And actually, this is part of our job description as a church, to create opportunities for us to serve together, whether here on Sunday mornings or out in the community. You know, on Sunday mornings, like, man, we are, we are uninterested in, quote, unquote, playing church. But we want to create opportunities like investing in the next generation, for instance. Or setting the table such that we can worship and share the gospel and, and sing the Lord's praises and help build one another up and help those who don't know him come to know him. And if you're at all interested in that, there's ways to get invo involved in that. You can fill out a connection card, let us know you're interested in, in serving. And it's our job to try to help, help you see where that, that might be here on Sundays, but also out in the community. That's the whole idea behind Trunk or Treat. We're not just trying to have fun passing out candy, as fun as that is. That's not why we're spending a lot of energy, time, resources to do it. Why are we doing it? We want to have an event. We want to host an event where we can break down barriers to Christ. We want to, in a fun, generous, easy, low-hanging invitation of a way, do an event where we say, hey, we're here as a church in the community wanting to be a light and love, bringing people together, and we'd love for you to be a part of it. And come hear the gospel. You're, no one's going to be preaching at Trunk or Treat. But we're going to be inviting people to come such that if they want to come, they might come and hear more about Jesus explicitly. And so that's why we'd love to have you come out to that. Because even just being there, representing, just being a light of Christ helps us to go, hey, we are here to love you in the name of Jesus. So there's opportunities. Uh, there's experiences. You know, if, when you think about the gift, the unique gift that God has given you. I'll just be real quick on this one. Let's say you have the experience of working with youth in the past in another church or whatever the case may be. I'm not trying to say there will be opportunities or needs that exactly align. But let's say it does. You might as well not reinvent the wheel if you have those giftings. If you've served there before. I'm just using by way of example. And people at that previous place where you're serving with youth are like, man, you've got a gift working with kids. And it doesn't tire you out to death. You're a miracle. You should serve in the... And I'm just... <laughs> We love you guys. You love you, youth leaders. You get the idea. There's experience. Oh, and then, of course, there's resources. I don't need to stress this. We've talked about this one. But we live in perhaps the, the richest part of the world, in the richest, part, the, the richest time in history. And if anything, we're called to, as a church, lead out in living generously, not using our re resources primarily exclusively for ourselves, but looking to steward for sake of loving others, loving our community, and ultimately helping them hear about Jesus. Do you know how you're uniquely gifted? Do you know the opportunities in front of you that can work for the things that last? Three things we need to understand. God works generationally. He has unique, uniquely gifted you for his greater purpose in life. And then number three, we need to know that God has, equipped, has more than equipped you for the work. Okay? Uh, we see this in verse 7 and 8. Uh, for this reason, I'll just reread here. Fan into flame the gift of God which has been in, in you through the laying on of my hands. For the spirit God gave us does not make us timid, but gives us power, love, and self-discipline. 
So do not be ashamed of the testimony about our Lord or of me, his prisoner. Rather, join with me in the suffering for the gospel by the power of God. That's kind of a funny pitch to try to get someone excited about serving, wouldn't you say? Hey, I want to get you excited about serving, guys. Join with me in suffering. You know, it's, I think it's kind of... Paul's being real, though. And I think we need to be real. Like, this life has hardship and challenges. But these are the things that we need to press into. And, the, and what he's saying is, God has more than equipped you in the midst of those struggles, in the midst of those hardships. If you're an underliner, un- underline the words, more than. He's more than equipped you. For the spirit God gave us does not make us timid, but gives us power, love, and self-discipline. Here's what Paul is not saying to Timothy. Timothy, you weak dude, like, drum up some strength already. Timothy, I need you to, I need you to suck it up, man. I need you to reach down deep and find some strength somewhere in there and go about important things. That's not what he's saying. What is Paul saying? He's saying, Timothy, you already have the power of God in you. It's not of you. It's already in you. Live into that. And I don't know about you, I find that deeply encouraging. Because when, it talk, when we're talking about leaving a lasting impact, let alone enduring through life's challenges and living, living a life for things that last, I cannot do it in my own strength. It's just not going to happen. The, the things of God, and yet in His strength, all things are possible. And that strength, that spirit of power is already in you. He's more than equipped you. I want to I get real practical and talk about ways we can live into this. Okay, We've talked about things we need to know. Now we're going to go a little bit more quickly and talk about ways that we can live into this. And specifically, we're given this really wonderfully helpful phrase to fan into flame the gift God has given us. Okay, So three ways we can fan into flame the gift God has given us. Number one, we need to remember our purpose. Remember your purpose. You can't fan into flame a gift that God's given you, let alone into the purpose that he's called you if you don't remember what it is, if you're not leaning into it from the get-go. This last week we had a wonderful time uh, having our first all-staff conference retreat uh, where we went to a conference down in, in the Southern California area. It was so much fun hanging out with the staff, getting to learn together, getting to be together. I hope it p- pays dividends into the future, uh, not only of the staff, but into the church. But on the way back, I had the chance on, on the plane to ask one of our, our leaders. I asked her, I said, what was your, what's your big takeaway from this conference? Like, what do you feel like God was, was teaching you through this conference? And without skipping a beat, she said, remembering my purpose. I said, that's interesting. Tell me more about that. What do you mean? She said, well, it's interesting. So I feel like life in general, but even in vocational ministry, I can just get about doing things, making all the preparations, doing all the planning, executing the, 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 the plan and, and all, the, all the different things that I, I, I've got to do, I've got to execute, and I forget what it's all about sometimes. This was a really helpful trip because it reminded me of the why behind all of that. And just for the sake of it, I was like, well, and how would you articulate that purpose? She kind of looked at me like, come on, you know that. I said, what? She said, helping people know Jesus, put their faith in him, helping people who have grow in him. And I get to especially do that in the area of ministry, area of ministry that I have oversight for. She's like, I'm, I'm really excited about that. And we got into this, you know, conversation about how, have you ever heard of a mission drift? It's human nature to drift in our mission, to drift in our purpose. It's human nature that if you have a purpose in life, whatever it is, you have a minute, uh, um, uh, mission in life, you're not going to drift into that. You're going to naturally drift away from that. Is that making sense? So we need to remember the purpose that we have. That's what fanning a flame is, right? If you think about a flame, it's like if it's getting ready to go out or if it's just a little like a couple coals with embers that go in, like you got to get some oxygen in there. And if we're not remembering our call, we have no place to start. But Paul's not just saying, hey, make sure that you keep it from dying out this flame. He's saying, fan it to flame such that it's rip-roaring. White hot. We got to remember our purpose. And number two, as far as leaning into it, is we need to not shrink back. Don't shrink back. Because remember, the thought here that Paul is saying to Timothy, he's saying, this is not a power that you need to just find in and within from yourself, Timothy. This is a power that's already in you by the power of, of God that the Spirit has given you. So for, for you, that just means don't shrink back. 
One of the things that we're really focusing in on as we go through uh, Rooted Together in our current groups is uh, sharing our stories, our faith stories. For those of you who've, who've done that already, I hope, I hope it's been a helpful experience where sharing them, one or two of us, as we, as we go on through our meetings. Um, but do you remember the, the prompt that we're giving us ourselves as we, as we go through this, as we share our story or what's classically known, our personal testimony? The prompt we're saying is, hey, let's share how we came to faith and what Jesus means to us, but in a way that somebody who never went to church could understand or somebody who doesn't identify as Christian would, would, would track and follow. And of course, that's very purposeful. Why? Because we want to be able to share, understand our story, the reason for the hope that we have in Christ, such that if we get opportunity to share it with those around us, our neighbors, our coworkers, whatever the case may be, a random person who's asking, why are you doing a church at a trunk or treat event? We can share our story. And one of the things I love about this is the main reasons why most Christians, let alone in a place like this, don't go there when it comes to sharing the faith is because, well, they're, sc- they're scared that they might not have the answers that might be asked. Or they're scared that they'll come across as proselytizing or preachy. But guess what? Sharing your story is neither of those things. It's just sharing your story. It's not an argument. It's just putting it out there. And so there's many opportunities to not shrink back. And I'm happy to report, uh, by way of encouragement, current family, that just in the last few weeks, I've heard of at least two instances in the life of the church of people sharing their story and it leading to at least two individuals putting their faith in Jesus. Isn't that incredible? Now think about that. What would happen if more of us didn't shrink back? As we're sharing our story, we're not going, and you've got to believe. You better feel guilty if you don't. We're just saying, this is who Jesus is to me. This is who he is for you. Will you receive that? Leave it. But we got to not shrink back. Third way to live into this is just to get moving. Just to get moving. Meaning, not overly complicated. Like, we've got to take stock, think about things, ask ourselves questions like, how am I uniquely gifted? What sorts of opportunities are, for, are there in front of me? But the main thing is we just got to get moving. Just, just step into it. You know, not, not think, oh, I'm not sure. Maybe that's an opportunity. Maybe it's not. Like, well, just if it's maybe an opportunity, step into it, see what God does. You know, we just got through with a, um, a sermon series with the metaphor of sailing. Allow me to do a little bit more sailing metaphor. I love to sail. That hasn't been obvious. But one of the ways I think about this one is just get moving. It's like if you're out on the water and you're in your boat and you don't have your sails up, you can't, not only are you not moving anywhere, you can't adjust where you're going either. You're just drifting. You know what I mean? But if you have your sails up and you're, you're going along, even if you're heading in a not great direction or a direction you feel like that's not the direction I want to go, you have the momentum to adjust and steer in the direction where you, where you want to go. Is this, are we tracking? Sim- it's similar in the spiritual life. If you're just sitting there and just going, well, I don't know what I do or I'm, I don't want to step out or in faith or whatever case, versus trying, the Lord will direct your steps. He'll show you your unique giftings. He'll show you opportunities. He'll lead you into things that you otherwise probably wouldn't have happened had you just been sitting there. The point is we got to just get moving. As the band begins to make their way up, um, I feel I, I want to end considering a very famous parable that Jesus taught that I think is essentially all of what Paul is getting at here with Timothy. It's a very famous parable. It's the parable of the talents. And in this parable, Jesus said, it's, he said, the kingdom of God is like a, an owner, a master, going away on a journey. But before he went, he called his three servants to him, and he gave them each a number of talents. Now, a number of talents back in that day was a lot of money. And a lot of scholars, they don't know exactly how much, but most think between the equivalent of today's economy, one million and six million dollars. But that's not all, because it was back in the time, oh, sorry guys, you get hang out for one second, I'm sorry. Yeah, no, you guys are good. That's actually really cool timing. The meta thought of like talents and that sort of thing. Um, no, we love you guys. Appreciate your ministry. But that's back in, t- in those times. It would be even back when people were making pennies, okay? So we're talking a lot of money, relatively speaking. He gave to the first servant ten talents, the second servant five talents, the third ser- servant one talent. Point being, all of them got mind-boggling amount of resources. And we're told that the third servant went off and just buried his talent in the ground and uh, didn't do anything with it. And Jesus is clear in his teaching. It didn't go well for that servant when his master returned because he just, he squandered the gift that God had given him. 
But then with the first two servants, the one that had ten, the one that had five, we're told explicitly that they went, quote unquote, at once and put their talents to work. And we don't know by what means or what creativity, but they ended up doubling their talents. And I love that little fact that we're not told because guess what? Those guys probably lived with stress, anxiety, pressures of how do I double this thing or how do I make it work or am I losing my... They probably had all that because that's called the human condition. But God working through all managed to double their talents at the end. And anyways, when it came time for the owner to come back with those guys, they came up, they were excited And he said the very famous words, well done, good and faithful servants. You have been faithful with a little. You thought that was a lot? You've been faithful a little. You'll be entrusted with much, much more. Come and share in your master's happiness. That's the goal. That's it. We've been, you and I, we've been each entrusted with much. Spiritual gifts, opportunities, resources, time, experience, all those sorts of things to come alongside in his great eternal purpose to help people know and grow in Christ. And we are seeing the Lord do that. And the water's warm. You could jump in with us. We'd love for you to join. We get to come alongside the one who gave up everything so that we could have these opportunities. He died on the cross for the forgiveness of sins that we we brought back into forever relationship with him. And because of that, we can now make that available to others. How has he equipped you uniquely and given you opportunities to do just that? Let's pray. Father, thank you for the call to join with you in living for things that last. And thank you for the the same spirit who lives in those who follow you, the spirit of power that helps us to not shrink back and and the spirit that will accomplish the purposes that you set out for, for in us, that we... All we have to do is just more or less just kind of show up and live out in faith. And where we mess up, which will be often, probably more often than not, there's grace and forgiveness. And you even work through our brokenness. It's in our weakness. Your strength is made perfect. But Father, would you help us be a church that doesn't shrink back? Not in an obnoxious, soap on the box, preachy sort of way, but in the same way that Christ lived and loved and died for us. Would you help us be a light of love in the community? even at something as simple, quote-unquote, as a trunk or treat? Would you use that to help people come out, ultimately come to know you, put their faith in you? Thank you for the little ones who are back there learning right now. Would you help many of them grow up to be pillars of your faith, future Timothys, future Loises and Eunices? Would you help us to be like Paul, saying of others, my dear son, my dear daughter? We can only do this because of the the love that Christ first gave us. We pray this all in his name. Amen.